Okay, so when we let off, left off in the last video, we were looking at uh, the time to 100% infection versus the initial population. But let's imagine that now that we've done this, we're kind of curious how does uh, the time to 100% infection, how, do, how does the graph that we actually get to that 100% infection look like, right? So we don't want to look at the final data, we want to look at the data getting to that final point, right? Uh, the graphs that we've talked about so far are all ends of run results. One important aspect of agent-based modeling, one of the cool aspects of agent-based modeling in my mind, is that you also can record all the transitionary data, the data that gets you from the initial condition to the final standpoint to see how things are looked at. Right? Uh, sometimes these are called runtime graphs uh, or time series graphs, right? Um, and they, but they require a lot of data, right? And in many cases, uh, depending upon how big your data sets are, it's gonna require a lot of work to create them, right? Because you're gonna have to output data for every single point in time. Now, if you're only running for 10 ticks, it's not that much. But if you're running for say 10,000 ticks, that's a lot of data you're gonna be outputting to your graph for even one model run, yet alone for all model runs. So think carefully before you output all the data, whether or not you actually need it. So I'm gonna pause here and we'll go back to our spread disease model and we'll look at how to actually do this in NetLogo. Okay, so we're back in NetLogo and we wanna create this runtime data, right? This time series data that allows to examine uh, the rate of infection over a run, right? And so to do that, you know, we probably, we kinda wanna just, we still wanna look at like the rate of population density, right? So we're gonna go to our population density uh, experiment we're going to hit duplicate, uh, and that's going to create a copy of it exactly, the exact same inputs. And we're going to call this experiment runtime instead of calling it just the population density because we're going to look at it. And the first thing we're going to want to do is measure runs at every step, right? Now, that's all fine and good, right? Except for the fact that, um, you know, what are we now looking at? What do we want to analyze? What's the output we want to look at? It's no longer the, the last tick right because we don't want to look at the time what we want to do is we want to know at each time step how many people are infected with the disease and so we need to change our output from ticks to count turtles with infected right and we can hit okay to save that and then we can hit run and we can output it to the desktop I'd already done this before, so it's there. And sure enough, right, we can get the outputs from this. And it's done. So now we're going to go into R to actually analyze that data. Okay, so I'm back in R, and I'm going to analyze that runtime or time series data that we generated in the last uh, set of experiments. Uh, and so one of the first things um, I'm going to do is we're going to do the same HMIS, bring the error bar command. And then you'll notice that I had to change uh, the, the data file now to point to the runtime data file, which is the output when we run the runtime experiment, right? So this is a whole new set of R code uh, that's going to analyze the R data itself, but it's going to be similar in some respects. Right? The next thing we're going to do is assign new column names uh, because and they're pretty much the same, except for now we have this count turtles with infected at the very end, right? Um, and R does this thing where it just puts in periods whenever it doesn't know what else to put in. So you get a bunch of periods there. But um, we're just gonna rename that to infected. We'll rename the step, et cetera. So um, now if you do a head data after we rename the columns, it's much easier to kind of understand what's going on. Um, you also notice, by the way, the runs are out of order. So we're gonna have to you know, think about how to deal with that if we need to. Luckily, um, as you'll see, we probably won't have to in most cases. Um, so the next step, and this is something I like to do with runtime data a lot of times, is let's just look at all the data, right? Let's just look at what all the data says, right? And so we're just gonna plot whatever we wanted on the x-axis versus whatever we wanted on the y. So on the x-axis, we wanted the step, and on the y-axis, we wanted the number of infected, right? So if we plot that, we get this graph, which, you know, is interesting, but it's not clear what's going on, right? What are these lines different than the others? Now, I can make a guess that this is 50 um, 
agents in the population, 100, 150, 200. In fact, it's not a guess because I can line them up and see that that's roughly what it is. So one of the things that makes this graph hard to read is the fact that we don't know which of these lines corresponds to which of the different uh, numbers, initial number of people, but also the fact that they kind of, you know, they're going to different values, right? So the 200 goes to 200, 150 goes to 150, and so forth, right? So let's create a cleaner version of these graphs. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new field in the data frame, which is called frac infected or fraction infected, right? So frac infected is going to be equal to the number who were infected divided by the initial number of people, right? So that should tell us the fraction of the population that's infected, right? The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to actually color and give different point symbols to the different uh, initial number of peoples. So I'm still graphing the steps versus the fraction, now versus the fraction infected. But then I have this command that says, set the character for each point to either one, two, three, or four, based upon what the number of people was for that particular point in the row, right? And that, I first have to convert that to a factor, and then I convert that back to a numeric to get an index into this array that I just created. Um, and then I can do the same thing for color, right? So take the number of people, convert it to a factor, which is an R thing that just allows it to be, say, 50 as a factor, 100 as a factor, so forth. And then convert that to a number, which is gonna assign zero to 50, one to 100, and so forth, right? Um, and then give, and then I'm just gonna give all this a title, right? And once I do that, and I plot the results, right? And I pull my window back up, you see that now, not only do they kind of compare them because they're all kind of on the same axes, but I now also can see the different colors in which each of the different points is. Um, and I can add a legend to that as well um, so that we can make sure we know which is which point, right? We can do this by saying that the legend text is equal to the levels of the factor, uh, and then the character is equal to one, two, three, four, and the color is equal to one, two, three, four as well, right? Um, so now once I've done all that, I can save off my graph and I have some data that's starting to help me understand. However, the problem with this is that we're still looking at all the data at once, which can be difficult to kind of really wrap your head around as to what's going on. So one thing we can do is we can start to aggregate the data. But unlike in the previous case where we aggregated data, we're not just aggregating by the number of people we're also aggregating by the steps. So what we want to do is what's the mean value of a run where we set the initial number of people to 50 at say time step 175, right? Or you know where the initial number of people is 200 at time step say 10, right? And so we're gonna calculate all that and then we're also gonna calculate the standard deviation of that same data so we can put error bars around that, right? Uh, so once we've done all that, we can now plot an error bar graph where we're looking at the step versus the fraction infected, and then we take that fraction infected and we add the standard deviation and we subtract the standard deviation so we can kind of understand how the data looks. Now, the problem is that when we look at this data, right, um, we're simply plotting every single point and we haven't added the coloring and we haven't done a bunch of stuff, uh, so it's not as obvious what the different um, points are and what's going on with it, right? So we want to do something, and one thing you might notice is that like plotting every single point when you have up to 500 steps produces a lot of data that makes it hard to differentiate. So one of the first things we're going to do is we're going to take that mean data that we just aggregated, and we're going to only look at every 10 steps, right? So what we do is we take the original data and we say only include steps where when you divide by 10, you get a remainder of zero. This is the modulus operator, and the modulus operator takes an input, divides it by a number, and then gives you the remainder. So this will give us 10, 20, 30, 40, right? So we're gonna do that for both the standard deviation and the mean data. So now we only have in this sub data set, the every 10 steps data. Now, you know, those data sets are actually quite big, right? And we don't really need all of that data that's in them. Right, so let's actually create our data set that just has the data we want for this graph. So we're gonna take, we're gonna use that cbind command again to take just the step data, the number of people data, the mean from the mean sub data set, 
the standard deviation from the, from the standard deviation data set, and we're going to put it all in the data we're just calling ag sub, which is a subset of the original aggregated data, right? And if you look at this, right, it just has the data we want in it, right? Um, so step, number, of people, mean, and standard deviation. So now that we have exactly the data we want in the table, I'm going to, instead of trying to plot all the data at once, like we've been doing, right, one plot command, I'm actually going to build up the plot over time. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot um, just the data that has 50 uh, initial people in it, right? In this case, initial and final people, same. But so I'm going to say with the ag.sub data that we just created, when the ag.sub number of people is equal to 50, right? Then plot the step versus the mean value of that data set um, in this uh, in the x with the black color, uh, and, and there's your um, labels, right? And so you can see this. And now it, I can add to this graph incrementally over time. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot the ones with 100. And rather than using plot, which will create a new plot, I'm going to use points, which will add points to the current graph, right? So then I can add point the 100 people and the 150 and uh, the 200. And you'll notice for each of these, I give them a different PCH and a different color so we can differentiate. I can then also add a legend so that it's obvious which one is which, right? 50, 100, 150, 200. In this case, I just spell them all out because I know exactly what it is because I apply them in this way, right? Now I can add um, error bars too in the same way. And the error bar command is uh, similar to what it was before, except we're gonna say add equals true, which means just add them onto the data I already have. The, other, the only other command I have to tell is I have to tell what color to make the error bar, right? Because it doesn't know that automatically. So I, I'm going to tell it, you know, for 50, make the error bar black, for 100, make it red, and uh, so forth, right? Um, and then, you know, add my, you know, I can add my title. It's actually already there because it's in the previous one, so we can actually take that command out. And I can save that data. And now we have a nice runtime summary of the data. And what you can see, right, from looking at this is that it's clear that the diffusion pattern that when you go down to 50 is a lot slower than it is at 100, 150, and 200. But the 100, 150, and 200 are pretty darn close to each other, right? A lot of the error bars are overlapping, not necessarily different than each other in any particular time period in terms of the fraction of number infected. Uh, but yeah, this kind of gives you a nice way to look at time series and runtime data for your models.